All right, welcome to the June 10th and on creds working group meeting. Welcome from rainy us Amsterdam or uh, near near to Amsterdam. That's where I am this week um, at a conference that will be in Amsterdam. So um, I am hanging out in Europe for a couple of weeks. Um, summary, I've got... I, I went to EIC last week, a conference in Berlin, and learned about um, what is being done for privacy and unlinkability where ZKPs are not used. So I wanted to summarize and let people know about that and what's being done there and get responses and opinions. Um, a little bit of a conversation and hope, hopefully, Mike, you can help me out on this, on, on how these fit together and um, in particular, BBS support, because I should have. That there. Um, so that's what we're talking about. A uh, reminder that um, <clears throat> we are recording the call, and so I'll be posting it here after the meeting. Um, that this is a Linux Foundation and Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the uh, Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect and the Hyperledger code of conduct is in effect. Um, preliminaries, um, welcome to all. Uh, anyone want to introduce themselves? Rudra, I don't think I've seen you on the meetings earlier. You want to? Yeah, him and I connected, here? so I invited him. Okay. Oh, good. But otherwise, go ahead. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Rudra. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, myself, Rudra Panda, uh, I work uh, for Charles Schwab. Uh, but uh, I'm very interested in this topic. I, I connected with my class to it, and uh, he suggested okay. me to join this group. Uh, more joining as a personal capacity, not from as a Charles Schwab representative, uh, because of my deep interest in this topic. So, looking forward to a lot more and work work with you. So thank you. Good. Welcome. And Francis, you were on the last call. Yeah, I was on a few weeks ago, but the I think yeah. the last one is because I was traveling. Um, okay. I'll do a quick intro and I appreciate you setting this up. But yeah, my name is Francis Kim. I work for Knox Networks. I'm one of the architect leads there and focus on identity and privacy and compliance. And we're a fintech software for regulated financial institutions. So okay. obviously privacy and uh, any privacy preserving tech techniques are very interesting when it comes to payments and tokenization, asset transfers and stuff like yeah. that. So love to just learn more about how Anon Creds can do selective disclosures, derived disclosures, see if we can apply that uh, solution. Maybe even, you know, we have our own DID method as well. We'd love to, to be part of uh, Anon Creds uh, DID method as well. So, okay. And, and what uh, was the company again? I heard networks, but I missed the first part. Knox, K N O X. Okay. Knox Networks. I'll type it in here. Okay. Yeah. As in Fort Knox? Yeah, sort of like that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we're, we're a small startup and, uh, you know, zero knowledge proofs. People are interested, but people aren't really using it that much, it seems. And we'd love to just implement okay. it. And, you know, at least I've got proof of concept or something like that. And, see how uh, i'm just a big fan of dids and vcs in general and obviously okay. knowledge proof so i just want to start using that okay good well welcome thank you um so any other comments notes um uh agenda requests anyone have right now before we get started I'm here at Identity Week in Amsterdam this week, and DICE is in Zurich next week, and I'll be there as well. Um, for those not familiar, DICE is IIW, Internet Identity Workshop, um, but based you, in Europe. You and I just traded Mountain. spots. You and I, I just know. traded spots because I was there last week <laughs> or two weeks ago. Yeah. All right. Um, I, so at um, EIC last week, I got the full information on what is the privacy and unlinkability story without ZKPs in MDL and in um, the use of SD Jots. And I thought it would be worth sharing it with this group just to let you know what what they're doing because it's kind of it is kind of interesting. 
um, the approach and just get feedback and response. Um, so basically with, um, here, let me move this, whoops. <laughs> no, that's definitely not what I wanna do. Um, I might as well go into slide share mode, why not? Okay. Um, so uh, there is a strong desire even amongst those not using ZKPs for privacy and unlinkability um, in, uh, in the use of verifiable credentials. And this is, from what I understand, what is um, not only proposed to be used, but what is supposedly being implemented. And so I thought I would share that. Um, selective disclosure, predicates, unlinkability, including revocation, all using NIST approved cryptography and not using any ZKPs. So that's kind of the, the um, interesting story of, of what they're doing. And here's how, um, here's how they're doing it. So selective disclosure is done with um, the approach done with SD jots, which is basically um, you salt the hash of the data item of the claims, you sign that, and then um, when you present, you sign you present all the signatures, but you only disclose whatever fields you want, and the salted hash can be verified, uh, the, the, the disclosed data can be combined with the salt to verify the hash of what you do disclose. So you're verifying what the issuer has sent and you're verifying with the disclosed data um, that that data is accurate. Um, MDL, uh, mobile driver's license, uses essentially the same mechanism. Um, and then there is a, uh, VCDI SD as well that I, I know is different and I don't quite, uh, I didn't uh, look up what is being done. So that is yet another scheme, but that's basically how you do so selective disclosure. Um, so again, standard cryptography, no zero knowledge proof, just simply signing um, the hashes of the claims um, with salts and then um, disclosing the, the data that you wanna disclose. Um, for predicates, they have the <laughs> very fancy way of, of simply put a Boolean value in, um, like saying over 21 true, over 25 false, and you put whatever, the issuer puts whatever predicates they want to put in and put the true and false in as a calculation. So obviously not dynamic. Um, if the person gets their credential um, the day before their birthday and two days later, the, those um, claims are out of date and so on. But they do have it. That's the way they suggest doing it. So basically nothing, nothing at all, but just um, a, a, a suggested way to do that. And then, of course, you can selectively disclose any one of those that are of particular interest. So if you wanted, you could put, you know, over 21, over 22, over 23, and then you selectively disclose any ones you want to do. But um, a little weird and not not that useful, but also you know dead simple. It's just a, a normal claim. This is the interesting one um, that I was kind of surprised at because I I'd sort of heard this, but I did not re realize that there actually um, there are implementations of this. Evidently, implementations out in the wild. So what they do is um, batch issuance of the same credential, each to be used once. So um, essentially you get um, every credential is only used once. You get a whole pile of, of them. And then when you need new ones, um, you, you get a new one. Now, the, the complexity here is that um, one of the other things they want to do is hardware um, based key pairs for the holder. So on your phone, what they want you to do is generate a key pair using the um, hardware enclave on your phone, get a key attestation that it is a hardware uh, key from Google and Apple. Um, so you generate X key pairs, 200 key pairs or 100 key pairs. You request a batch of 100 credentials and you pass in um, basically 
a hundred did keys, um, which are at, with the hardware keys and the attestations associated with them, so that the issuer can verify that they're all hardware-based keys and um, and has all the public keys for them. The issuer then generates X credentials and issues those to the holder. Um, the holder uses each credential one time and signs the presentation with the associated private key that goes with that credential. So each credential is going to have its own did key, all, all unique. And then when they go to use it, they go find the private key associated with the did and, um, and sign it. And that key is um, only signable once? Because if they use it yeah. again, that defeats yeah. the whole purpose. Exactly. Exactly. It's only usable once. Which is yeah, pretty interesting. This is just uh this is just you prove all over again. Is that what you prove was? I didn't I, I had yes. never I've never looked at that. Okay. You you prove well back in the early two thousands, right? There were two options for um doing selective disclosure kind of on the credential systems. One was you prove mm -hmm. by Microsoft and the other was okay. identity mixer from IBM. This yeah. is just you prove all over again. Okay. If you go look at YouProof, um, it does the exact same thing. Maybe a little different, slightly, but the idea was you you basically, when you need a credential, you go get it from the issuer in real time, and then like say, go to the issuer, I need one, and then present it, and then it's burned. It's very, very similar. And there were all sorts of bugs and issues and vulnerabilities with yeah. YouProof. Yeah. So yeah. to me, we're just reinventing the same problem all over again. Yeah, yep. Um... So in, in answer to the question about the key attestation, so a key attestation is that you, you contact Google and Apple at the time you generate the key pair, and it provides an attestation that the key pair was um, is, is protected in hardware. Um, yeah, that's you don't new. actually Yeah, so you don't actually get the key. Um, what you get... And the way they do that, and I'll go into a bit of detail here, the um and that's talked about here. So the the private key is is generated in the hardware module. The hardware module contains a symmetric um key that it uses to encrypt the private key. It hands the private key out to the wallet, and the wallet stores it in local storage. So one of the things I wondered is, you know, how many private keys can be in the hardware module? Like, are there any limitations? And does it vary by phone and stuff like that? Well, that's that's how they get around it. They they generate the private key, encrypt it with a key that's only inside the hardware, and then hand it out to be stored in, in, in local storage on the phone, just like any other data in the app. Um, to use it, obviously, you have to then hand it back to the hardware module it decrypts the private key and then uses it to sign the data and then hands the signed data back to the app that's using it. Um, so that's the general process. Um, once you exhaust the supply, you simply request another um, batch. Um, and, and that's how they achieve unlinkability. Now, um, whoops. The next one is revocation. I, I've wondered about revocation and, and got a follow up on that. What they do there is they're using status list 2021. And so those not familiar with that, there's um, it is a um, you have a set of credential in the registry. Uh, the registry is a bit array where each credential is a bit and um, they uh, basically every credential has a bit. And so if it's on, the credential has been revoked. So each instance of, of a credential gets its own bit. So the it's not the batch of credentials, it's each instance of the batch gets a bit. And so, um, and then, and, and that way it, it, it continues to be unlinkable. Um, you're you're not getting it. You're getting it for that one time use credential. And then obviously, if the issuer decides, oh, I'm going to revoke those credentials, it issue it revokes the entire batch. Um, but each, you know, revoking the batch consisted of revoking all of them. 
and and for as many batches as they've handed out. Um, it does allow um, monitoring by the verifier because the verifier does get a um, a registry ID and an index within it for the credential that they received. And so they can keep monitoring it. Um, not sure how much of a concern that is, but it's definitely something that's not ideal. Um, I think there is a solution for that. And I've got a, a, a little honestly, bit of a solution. That I honestly, think. I think their proposal's overcomplicated. There's an easier way to do this. If all you want is a one-time token, just base it on privacy pass. What's privacy pass? Privacy pass was was uh, it's a protocol that Cloudflare invented in 2017. It is now supported by all browsers. Their their main use case was so that you wouldn't have to keep re-entering those stupid captures over and over again. Yeah. So what they did is with Privacy Pass, it says as soon as you've done the CAPTCHA once, they issue you a bunch of one-time use tokens. Mm -hmm. The key for those, you sign it, or you basically have a private key that's associated with that. They sign it blindly. And then when you go to use it, like you unblind it and then just send the token, whatever it is, and it and that's it. And then they basically mm -hmm. say, have we seen this before? If we haven't, then that means it's not revoked. And if we have, then we just ignore it. There's no list to download. There, mm -hmm. It's like just dog simple. And it's based yeah. on, once you go to present, it's based on symmetric cryptography, like an HMAC. So it's going to be mm -hmm. much faster. And, and you're saying that for revocation or for the entire process? For the entire credential. Okay. For the entire credential, they use nothing but standard cryptography. Yeah. Works for every curve, works everywhere. And it's already built into browsers. Yeah, built into browsers. So why why are we why why are they wasting their <laughs> this this process of let's just reinvent you proof? Just you just base it on privacy pass. A bunch of other companies are. Hmm. Like they already have uh like I said, all the major browsers already have extensions for it. Like I think uh, Silk is one of them that that's supported in Firefox and Chrome. It's already built in. <laughs> so why are we reinventing the wheel with yeah, something I don't, that, that I, makes it, zero sense? Uh, I don't know how you would line that up with verifiable credentials and so on and so forth. So I don't. Well, know. they're just si they're just signing something, right? It's just a bunch of data bound to a hardware key. So with privacy pass, you just do the same thing, <laughs> um, right? The uh, remember, it's the issuer signing it, not the not the holder. That's, the holder is providing yep. a key. Yes, um, that's how that's how privacy pass works. The the they're okay. well, they call it. Yeah, they have issuers and the testers and things like that. So the issuer is who's signing your your well in the, in the privacy pass uh, protocol. They're called tokens. There, the issuer signs your token. If you try to present a token that has not been signed by the issuer, it'll bark and say, mm -hmm. nope, go away. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll have to take a look at that. I, it's, I, I don't know anything about it. never heard of it, so I'll take a look. Let me see if I can provide you the link here. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, so revocation is there. So... Um, the biggest thing I had about this was, is this even practical, this one-time use? And they're saying that it has been implemented and has been used. And in fact, we're saying that that it's out there. Does that give enough functionality um, using, using this approach? Why would you need revocation if it's a one-time use credential? Um, because if you haven't used it yet, it could get revoked in between before you use it. Well, that's this is again, this is why I like privacy pass. You know how they revoke it? They just delete the, the verification key. So you can't verify it. If it doesn't verify because I don't have a key that matches it. No, then... there's not a unique key for there's not a unique key from the issuer. There's only a unique key from the from the holder. Yes, same idea. They just delete it. Yeah, they, they have a yeah, public. They have a public key, and they just delete it. <laughs> but the issuer can't delete the holder's private key. They can't do that. No, it's not. It's not the private key. key. It's the it's the public key. Yeah, they can't do that either. 
the public key comes from the uh is in the credential sorry when i say delete i mean they're they're essentially saying these are the valid keys like if i get a presentation from this and then so if it's not in the list they say oh it's been revoked yeah i mean that's the same as this you still have to download something at the time of presentation to see if it's been revoked You yeah. still have that list. Yeah, I still don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was um I as I say, you know, I've heard rumblings of this and um have not really heard that it was actually implemented. And their um like Tobias Looker from Matter was saying they've got an implementation and that the California DMV implementation is this with you know, batches of credentials. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying, I think there's a much simpler solution. You just base it on privacy pass. Okay. The um, protocol has already been vetted for years. Yep, I, yeah. I probably the link in chat. Yeah. It's okay. The, the protocol has been well vetted. There's already an RFC standard for it. I mean, it's, it's well known. Mm hmm Okay. And I already know other companies basing access tokens off of this. I think Apple already does it too. Apple's already yeah. integrated this. The privacy pass. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Apple calls it private access tokens, but yeah, whatever. Apple chooses a name for their own implementation every time. Yeah. Whoops. Private access tokens. Sorry, just adding a note to the chat. Okay. Um, okay, any other comments from anyone on that? All right. Um, Maybe, uh, Steven, just one thing. You talk about the hardware model. Is, is this model exit in every form? Or just some pretty kind much, of model, pretty much. Um, any, I, I, what I understand is any recent phone would have it. So I think recent. if you go back far enough, you don't. But um, there was a few show of hands questions about if you know that the vast majority of smartphones have a hardware module in it. Okay. Okay. Thank. You. Thank. You. Yeah. So. One of the things that's always bothered me about the like the EU approach and what they were doing is they, you know, required this binding to the to a hardware key. And of course, that gives absolute linkability. But if you do it that you only use a credential once, um, then you don't have that linkability. Okay. So yeah. Obviously a lot more complex to manage. Um, but um evidently it's doable that said there are no open source implementations of this which is kind of interesting and as far as i know i i, I don't know how built into the standards they are like any standards i've read now i haven't read mdl that much or at all um so i don't know if mdl talks about this batch revocation um the Open ID for VCs is adding a batch endpoint, uh, a batch issue endpoint. So presumably that me that's what that is for. But that's I'm not aware. Um. Okay, on to the next topic, which is um, <laughs> Mike. Hoping you can can help me understand. So we have the Anoncreds V2 library. It has um, PS signatures underneath it. Is yep. Is something like the dot networks um, BBS library equi uh, conceptually equivalent to an on credits, or is it a lower level? Uh, their um, their crypto library is lower level. It's just the I cryptography. Thought. Now, if okay. you look in their library, they also have the PS signature as well. Okay, and, I, I saw you your note today about that. Okay, and I've up and I've updated a uh, BLS signature or the Blissful library. So it's compatible yeah. with theirs. 
So okay, good. they could they could plug in the blissful with theirs, or we could plug in theirs with ours. Okay. It's not that complicated. Okay. So um, that being said, there are other groups that do use the B the PS signatures because they uh in fact that's been around for a long time. They use yeah. a, a slightly variant called coconut uh for threshold yeah. issuance. But that's PS. So what I'm talking is BBS. Yep. So yeah. how do we get yeah, BBS we just... support into an on credits V2? What's the best path? Should we uh presumably we would need a library that we get from something else, from somebody else. Is that correct? Well, that's what Agora would do. I've been writing it for Agora. I've just been bogged down. I'm putting one in okay. Agora and then we can just link it in and then off we go. Okay. So that's your, just, your approach is that you uh, have one in Agora. Yep. Yep. And just link to it. Okay. And that way it will have the features, not only of the core BBS library, but also the additional features necessary to support it on creds V2. Yeah. They're just hot swappable PS and BBS are hop swappable. Okay. And all the features you've got are would be available. Okay. Yep. Doesn't so matter. Background for those new Francis and, and Rudra. Um, so BBS um, supports um, unlinkable signatures and the core BBS as as defined at IETF, the 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 specification that's going through IETF standardization um, supports. Um, selective disclosure and unlinkability as core features, then there, it has extensions for um, uh, basically link secret. So this holder binding um, has extensions for um, uh, pseudonymous identifiers. So being able to get a, um, a, a, for a verifier to get a, a, a repeated identifier from a uh, a credential um, such that they can identify that it's the same user coming back, but each verifier gets a different one. So that allows um, the verifier to discover if a person is returning to their site and presenting the same credential, or they are a new, uh, a, a new, um, uh, or or they've never seen them before, but it doesn't allow correlation across verifiers. So that's a key feature. Um, what any of the BBS libraries I've seen do not support are, I think Doc Network supports some of these, but the additional features in an on-cred V2 include um, a quality of claims without disclosing the claims. So claims from two different um, credentials can be compared and proven to be the same without revealing the credential. Um, verifiable encryption, um, range proof, set membership. Um, 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 what else am I missing, Mike? I think that's most of them. So, and our creds has yeah. a, a rich list of, of ZKP based features. And so what library we use depends on what of those features each produce, e each supports the one I gather the the matter one is fairly old and unchanged, right, Mike? Hasn't been touched since I updated it. Yeah. Which was years ago. Yeah. There At is least three. one that's yeah. There is one that the W3C VCDI BBS working group has. And I'm trying to find where that is. Um, it supports um BBS. Um, link secret, a uh, blinded secret, I guess I should call because it it's generalized. Blinded secret and um, pseudonymous um, identifiers, um, holder and issuer based. And when you say Agora, uh, what are you referring to? Are you talking about that BIS uh, project Agora or something else? Mike? Agora? Agora yeah. is a labs project here at Hyperledger where I've been donating all of my cryptography libraries. So they're all open source. They're all free to use. 
some of them have been audited, some of them haven't, yeah. but uh, that's the point is the main motivation behind it. I, I'm trying to see who, who was asking that question. <laughs> uh, Francis. Francis. Oh, okay. So the main motivation was I develop a lot of cryptography libraries and I like them open source. I prefer cryptography to always be that way um, because I feel like too many problems have arisen from proprietary solutions or patents. But um, I used to keep them in my own repos, which presented a few problems. The first one is since they were my own, some companies didn't want to use them because, hey, they're an individual developer. If he disappears, right, those libraries, like who owns them now? Number two, I have been sued twice by companies to try and they tried to legally take those from me. Um, and so I did, this was another move to prevent that from happening since the LF owns those libraries now, since I've donated them, um, they would have to go after the Linux Foundation, which is a much bigger gorilla. And so by donating these cryptography libraries to LF, aka Hyperledger Labs, um, it solves both those problems. Now, LF owns the libraries, not me. I'm a maintainer of those libraries, but anybody can contribute to them. And they have. Some people have contributed to stuff already since I've donated them. And so most of the cryptography libraries that Noncreds 2 is based on rely on libraries in Agora. So they're not proprietary by any means. Anybody can use them. So the problem you have with Doc Networks is, well, they are MIT licensed. Doc Networks still owns those libraries. They are the license holder. So at any time they could withdraw it, they could change it, they could do whatever they want. And then you and are seeing that happen with well, well, we've seen that happen with quite a few companies, right? Like the MariahDB folks did this, HashiCorp did this, and a bunch of others are basically withdrawing their open source libraries and changing it to business source license instead. So um and and you've got a list of other ones. These are the five that are in Agora now, and then you have a uh, you have an additional set like Genora. Uh, is that what it's how you oh, Gen it? Gennaro? Yeah, that's Gennaro a DKG. is coming soon. It's yeah, coming I just soon. need to. Yep, just need to finish uh, some tidy up stuff. I've been so bogged. <laughs> I'm trying to push. Yeah, I've, I've got a deadline at work, so I haven't had time to do much. But Gennaro is a DKG. There's some other ones I'm writing as well. So like BBS is another one that'll be in there. Um, another, there's another two that are under audit. And once those audits finish, I will donate those as well. Okay. Which are the two that have, um, audits coming? Well, so Gennaro has been audited. Yeah. So yeah. I just need to, that so down. that one will, that blissful has been audited. So that that's yeah. already been, that's already there. Um, yeah. a verifiable secret sharing is another one. It's under audit. Um, and then some threshold, some other threshold MPC based libraries. So, uh, what's Doc Network's uh, relationship to Hyperledger? Are they just like an external source that you're just investigating, or? Um, yeah, they they're working on similar similar work. So we met up at a conference a while back and just started working with them. As well, at that conference, I met a couple of other people that were doing um, ZKP and and BBS based work, and they were both using the .dot networks libraries. Um, so sort of the idea is I'm, I'm finding a, a whole set of people who are out in the world doing an, uh, um, various ZKP VC related work. And I'm trying to see if we can sort of align and, and collaborate a bit more um, to get more out. Um, I don't know if you're aware, and on creds V1 has been out and been, and been used for years and it's, it's based on CL signatures and has all of the features we've talked about today, except for the um, advanced ones in, you know, certainly uh, link secrets, predicates, revocation. Um, and, and so that's been out for a while. And what we're talking here is what's the next generation going to look like and how soon can we get it available? So Mike, your feeling is that 
the, the BBS library we should use is the one that's coming, but but you haven't had a chance to finish. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be done probably within a, a week or two. It's just, okay. I've just been so bogged down. I know. Because I, I'm actually yeah. teaching a, a technical privacy PhD level course as well as my day job. And so it's, yeah. I've just been busy. <laughs> and then I was just at Eurocrypt two weeks ago. So yeah, yeah. How did that go? I published Any another news? paper. I published Excellent. another paper. If you look in the Agora repo, there's one called Key Share Proofs. That was one I was working on with a bunch yeah. of cryptographers. So, Excellent. Anyway, it just never seems yeah. to end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, and Mike, I've got now the audits. Um, you're still working on Gennaro to be contributing. Just tidying it so, up. Yeah, just tidying, just tidying it up. Tidying it okay. up. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I probably should just donate it anyway. It's just I'm one of those OCD people that likes cryptography libraries yeah. perfect. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, here's verifiable secret sharing under audit. Yeah. Okay. I'll just remove that line. Okay. Well, um, that's that's what I had for this meeting. Um, we are getting. Uh, or, oh, I should mention one other thing, which is we're getting um, Oracle Labs folks are um, now doing contributions. And um, so we've had a couple of PRs from them that uh, extends out um, the an on creds V2 Rust implementation. And um, Mike, you and I have to get together perhaps later this week to talk to um, our new mentor uh, mentorship program. Oh, that's all oh, that's right. Person, mentee. <laughs> um, yep. Uh, so, um, that will get started. And for that, we're working on um, a revocation manager for a non-creds V2 that implements, um, that is Alisar. a service for hand, for handling Alisar. So that work will begin almost immediately. All right, that's all I had for uh, this meeting. The next meeting is um, two weeks from today and late in the afternoon Pacific. So ridiculously late in Europe. So if you are calling from Europe, you might want to check the uh, recording. But otherwise, if if you're in the United States, it should be a reasonable time. And it's at 10 o'clock a.m. in Auckland. And that's one of the reasons we're doing that. We've got um, more folks from um, that part of the world. So we'll have uh, a meeting for them to join to, into. I do have uh, a question for you, Stephen. Uh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. did someone else? Someone? I think someone else oh, is going to say something. I'll let them speak first. I'll, I'll go after you, Mike. It's okay. It's just a general question. Oh, well, mine mine's a little more in depth. So go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, like, if we wanted to implement selective or a derived disclosure, like later this year, should we try to go with V one and on creds, or wait for V two? What do you What do you think? No, V two already has all that. It's good to go. Okay, and the people that have implemented it, like how long does it roughly take for them? Do you, do you have a rough idea? Um, we should talk about what you're doing. Maybe we could have a call, Francis, and and chat. Yeah, um, happy to help with that. Yeah, yeah, because I just want to like try to schedule it as part of our roadmap, and I just want to have like a rough idea how much to schedule and like rough sort of like efforts and estimates and tasks or something something like that just high level planning yeah, yeah. obviously i mean what i was gonna say what can help me get more code into agora is i am available for you know consulting and hiring <laughs> so <laughs> that that gives me a little more incentive to and time to do things <laughs> um maybe we can can are we connected offline Francis? I just sent you an invite on LinkedIn. So yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Let's have some conversations there and figure out what you're trying to do. And then I can at least give you a bit of guidance on on what is the appropriate strategy to take. Awesome. That's amazing. Um that that'd be pretty pretty easy. Um Mike, you were gonna ask some. Yeah. Um remind me which group is doing the they want so like all the features of a non creds tube, but with traditional cryptography without ZKPs. Um, so evidently, that is the ISO MDL folks. Okay. 
are you at all interested in making an equivalent like I was proposing based on privacy pass? I don't know. I'm going to take a look at it. Um, let me. Because back when I know. worked at Sovereign, I had a proposal when Privacy Fast first came out called Atomic yeah. Credentials, meant to be burned once. I call them Atomic really? because, yes. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Well, let me so take a look at it. Let me come back to you. This is the first I've ever heard of it. As a, and, and really, last week was the first time I've, you know, I've heard stories about the fact that, oh, we're going to have hardware based keys and, oh, you can do this batch thing. And, I kept asking people, is this real? Have you actually done it? And, uh, you know, people would say, well, no, we've never done it and, and stuff. But now <laughs> I had people actually saying it has been done and is in in use and, and that changes the picture. And the other thing was um, no one could explain, definitely not that they could both do the batch issuance, which I could understand that, but was that actually tied to hardware keys on the holder and key attestations and and now they're saying, yep, yep, it, it's doable and it's and it's been done. I don't know. So it's all brand new to me. I will definitely take a look at Privacy Pass and we can definitely follow up on that, um, both on Discord okay. and, and Mike, we can talk about it soon. Yeah, yeah I'm find just that curious if it paper. would be nice to say like a non-creds V2 offers both, right? There's yeah. There's a reusable credential, which is what we have now. Right. Yep. You have one, it's based on ZKPs. You can reuse it as many times as you want to do these ZKP-based mm -hmm. mm -hmm. approaches. Or there was this other approach that I called atomic credentials. Okay. Similar to you prove, you just get a batch of them and then you you use it once and it's burned. Yeah. And revocation yeah. was solely just deleting a pri a public key. Yeah. That was it. I don't I mean it's that's not so easy if you're doing it in a verifiable credential, but anyway, we can figure that out. Okay. Yep. All righty. Awesome. Good stuff. Okay. All right. Thanks, all. Thanks. See ya. See ya. Thank you.